Hi everyone, it's MJ and I originally created these slides for the Actuarial Women's Committee and I gave a talk on the 13th of October on exam tips and techniques. And I know I invited all of you guys to come but I, yeah, I think it was too short notice or some of you had business meetings or, or whatever. Uh, but essentially what we're going to be doing in this video is just going through the slides that I presented or had prepared for them that you guys can also use for, for your upcoming exams. So yeah, I mean, I just gave them an introduction. Um, what is interesting is that uh, I'm no longer just a consultant in the tech space, I'm now working full-time for Polygon, which is a layer two scaling solution for the Ethereum blockchain. And I'm actually in the, the NFT uh, area. So I, I am, yeah, I think I only started my role there on the 15th of October. So already these slides are a little bit outdated, but, Let's jump, uh, let's jump straight into it. So when it comes to exams, my view is that they've already started. So the exam is not just the three hours when you're writing or typing, but it's all the time before that as well. So how you spend your time now is gonna be crucial on whether you pass or fail this exam. Now, as actuaries, we tend to write a lot of exams. In fact, we spend a lot of time studying. So it makes sense to maybe take a step back and say, well, why don't we study how to study? Maybe let's look at what is the optimal learning strategy. And I know this sounds a little bit silly, but the best thing to do in an exam is to think. And I've been doing these courses, I've been marking a lot of uh, papers that students have done, assignments and all these things. And I find that what happens is that the students aren't, they aren't thinking at a deeper level. In fact, I often see students answering a different question to what is asked. And a lot of the times they lack structure, they miss out obvious points, or they start waffling about irrelevant things. And I kind of realize that when we come to answering exam questions, we're actually not very good at it. So maybe some solutions that we can look at is, think of the exam as having two main parts. There's the studying stage, and here we can use things from cognitive psychology, artificial intelligence, and I know the last one might confuse some people, we'll talk about why it's important, but it's mythology. And then of course, when it comes to the writing stage, that's how to read a question properly, how to think, and then how to structure your answer. And essentially the exam's got those two main parts. We're all now in the studying stage, and when we go into the actual exam, that's when it's gonna be the writing stage. Now, a lot of the stuff that I'm gonna be basing it on was because of uh, Blaise Pascal. He wrote this book called Pen C, uh, which is what I was reading uh, during lockdown last year. And I mean, Pascal, I think we all kind of know about him. He's, he's like the boy genius. I mean, he was writing things on projective geometry, looking at conic sections, even inventing the early forms of the calculator, all while he was just a teenager. I mean, then he even does stuff in physics with vacuums and fluids. But the reason why most actors know about him is because of the probability theory that he did with Pierre de Fermat, uh, especially expected value. I mean, that, that thing pops up all the time and it was Pascal who, who came up with it. But what I really like about Pascal is the way he was almost the first person to think actually. And we see that in his whole notion known as the Pascal's wager. Because people used to come to him and they used to say, Pascal, you're, you're a boy genius. You're a boy genius. Why do you believe in God? Like, why do you subscribe to, to religion? Because Pascal was a very devoted Catholic. Um, they said, you know, there's no evidence and all these kind of things. And Pascal says, no. He says, I, I agree. You know, the Bible's got enough light for, for us to base our faith on, but there's also enough shadow for, for it to cast some doubt. So we don't know. So he says there is uncertainty into the existence of God. But he says if we were to consider the frequency and severity, then it makes sense to, to believe in God. And, and the whole idea very quickly was that if there is no God and you don't believe in him, nothing happens. If there is no God and you do believe in him, nothing happens. But if you don't believe in God and there is no God, something bad might happen. And if you do believe in God and God does exist, then something great could happen. And he said, if you look at you know, the payouts or the expected values, um, 
It says, no matter what the frequency is, the severity is so severe if there is a God that one should believe in it, um, irrespective of how low that frequency would be. And like I say, it's very much a risk management answer. A lot of theologians are like, mm, you know, what about love? And people maybe come and say, well, you're assuming that the Christian religion is the only one. So, of course, there's a lot of philosophical debate that can be held around the final conclusion. But the way he thought about it, the way he constructed his argument, was, in my opinion, the birth of actuarial science, and it tied in very nicely with his probability theory that he was coming up with. I know the, there was the Italian Cardona, who was also kind of laying a little bit of the groundwork, but essentially this was the, the foundation of which actuarial science would be built upon. I mean, he heavily influenced Abraham de Mauve, who was a big champion of modern mathematical statistics, uh, and also Leibniz, who was the you know, the father of calculus. I know we, we think Newton kind of did calculus, and of course the Royal Society got Abraham because they thought he would be French and he'd be neutral to determine whether it was Newton the Englishman or Leibniz the German who, you know, came up with calculus. Uh, but Abraham was secretly good friends with, with Newton, and so he was like, mm, Newton, Newton is the champion of, of calculus. Interesting thing about Leibniz is he was the one who was originally sent um, a lot of mortality data and he passed on it and then Edmund Haley would take that data and of course construct the first premiums based on mortality and you know start to formalize actuarial science and that's why actuarial science kind of starts forming in, in London uh, but it very almost yeah could have formed in in Germany but Pascal, very, very important historical figure, so much so that I almost call him the great-grandfather of, of actuarial science, because Edmund Haley can maybe be seen as the grandfather, and then, of course, William Morgan as the, as the father. William Morgan was the guy who actually started to formalize the profession and not just the mathematics and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, um, let me not get too sidetracked on, on a history lesson. Let's rather come into why we're, why we're talking about Pascal. Because like I say, he publishes this thing in 1670. And in this book, he also talks about there being two types of intelligence. He refers to it as being, some people are mathematically intelligent and other people have got inquiry intelligence. Now, the thing about actuarial science is that it selects for mathematical, okay? Remember when you try to get into, into university, they looked at what was your maths mark. Or if you did really, really well in maths, everyone was like, oh, you should go and pursue actuarial science. And yes, a lot of the undergrad subjects are like that. But what we're going to see, especially now that we're in the later exams, that actuarial science requires both types of intelligence, both mathematical and inquiry. So like I say, the earlier subjects are very mathematical. These are your undergrad level. Um, these are your, I think yeah, the Brits are now calling them CMs and CSs, or in, here in South Africa, the A100s, the A200. But you know, this is stuff like financial mathematics, mathematical statistics, uh, you know, risk models, uh, and all these kind of things. They are very, very mathematical. But we then get into the later subjects, and these are more inquiry-based. So this is stuff that you sometimes do in your postgrad. Uh, these in the South African codes, the A300s, the F100s, and the F200s. So this is subjects like actuarial risk management, all the specialist subjects, as well as all the fellowship subjects. But let's maybe look at what we what we mean by inquiry. And I think a nice way to look at it is some of the inquiry professionals. So lawyers, detectives, philosophers, these are people who are very, very intelligent when it comes to inquiry. Because what do we mean by that? Investigation, asking questions, the process of finding answers, like I say, philosophy, and the fellowship level, we even have a joke saying that you always start your answer with, it depends, and you consider both sides before applying your actuarial judgment to determine what is the, the more likely situation to, to be. But yeah, with inquiry um, intelligence, like I say, it's it's very different to, to mathematical. So a mathematician will be able to do the calculation. The inquiry uh, you know, mindset will be like, well, why are we doing this, this calculation? So that's why, I mean, we're going to be talking about a little bit of things that I've pulled out of these DK books. I really enjoy them. Big Ideas Simply Explained. We're going to be pulling from the psychology book and we're going to be pulling from the philosophy book. Uh, and I think even later we even pull from the mythology one as as well. 
But when we turn to, let's say, psychology, in cognitive psychology, there was this guy called Jerome Bruner, who's actually still alive, but he, he, he revamped the entire American system uh, of education with his ideas. And his whole thing was that we learn things by active experience. So instructing someone is not just telling them something, but encouraging them to participate. And we acquire knowledge through the use of reasoning by constructive meaning from the information. And this is a form of information processing. And the whole idea here is knowing is a process, not a product. And the whole thing here is that you should first present ideas in a simple and intuitive way. You then continuously revisit and reconstruct them. And then finally, you start to connect all your knowledge in order to get comprehensive mastery of the subject. And this little quote here we see, when we acquire knowledge, we need to actively participate and reason rather than passively absorb information because that is what gives knowledge meaning. And I know at the beginning of every single actuarial course notes, they talk about the difference of active studying and passive studying, but still we see a lot of students, they go to passive studying. This is where you just read through the notes. This is where you go, you take a past paper and you take the solutions, you read the question, you read the solution, you go, mm, yeah, I would have done that. And you read the question, you read the solution, like, mm, yeah, I would have done that. Whereas active studying is putting yourself under exam conditions, writing out those papers, and then only going back and marking and then saying to yourself, why did I get it wrong? What was I looking at? What am I maybe missing? Was it content? Maybe I misread the question. You know, how do I improve on this process so that I can get more accurate? in the exam and these are the differences so there's different ways of studying it's not just the amount of time you put in but it's how you're doing it and if your studying is enjoyable uh, then it's probably more on the passive side studying should be tough it should be draining if it's on the active side because you really are using a lot of energy to do it so like I say that's a little bit of the of the psychology Coming into philosophy, there's this one model, um, and that is that we've got this DIKW pyramid. So this pyramid stands for data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. Like I say, it's just one model, it's one representation of reality. There are other ones, but we're gonna use this because it can be quite meaningful to help us understand how to study. So one of the first questions we can maybe ask is say, well, how do we transform data into information? And we can look at Jerome Brunner and the answer here is to give it meaning. So for example, if I just say 1991, okay, this is just a number, this is what we mean by a piece of data. Now already some of you, when you see a number like 1991, you're already thinking of maybe a date, but that's your brain working a little bit quicker. Um, if you just look at it at its face value, it's just a number, it's just a piece of data. It's only when I then tell you that, yes, you're correct, it is a date, and in fact, this is the year in which I was born, then you say, oh, MJ was born in 1991, that now is a piece of information. So 1991 on its own is just data, MJ was born in 1991, that is a piece of information. Now, what we love about data is that we can process it. You know, we can take 2021 minus 1991 and we can get 30. Again, this is just a piece of, of data. It's only when we now say, well, wait, isn't 2021 the current year and 1991 we've just been told was Michael's year of birth? Hmm, maybe this can give us some information around Michael's age. And yes, we can then say, you know, MJ is around 30 years old. This is another piece of information. So just 30 is data. When I tell you it's my age, it then becomes information. And if we look at data science, okay, this is statistics, mathematics, and all these computational tools, they aim to transform data into information. So they do a lot of data processing, and they try to give meaning to that data in order to get information. And yes, this is very, very valuable, but an actuary goes beyond. In fact, as actuaries, we now need to look at information to knowledge. So how do we transform information to knowledge? And again, if we had to use Brumer's ideas, we do it by connecting it. So a very, very trivial example, MJ is around 30 years old, piece of information. MJ lives in South Africa, information. The legal drinking age in South Africa is 18, that's information. Now, if we connect it, we can deduce that MJ is legally allowed to drink, and this is knowledge that we've deduced from this information. Of course, we can always just give a statement saying MJ is legally allowed to drink, and what we've done here is we've condensed this knowledge 
back into information. Now, what we see is knowledge is your web of information and it's formed through connection, through meaning and through reasoning. Now, a good little study tip is to try and distinguish information from knowledge. And the reason why you want to be able to do that is so that you only commit information and the connections to your memory. Okay, a lot of students fall into this trap of trying to learn knowledge off by heart and then they complain to me they say oh there's too much to learn I'm like there's actually not that much to learn if you can condense it back to information and its connections so what do I mean by this let's maybe give a very elementary example so if I say all fish like to swim and all cats don't like to swim and I say Joey's a fish and Bob is a cat Joey likes to swim Bob doesn't like to swim we see here that we have six pieces of information but we can condense it into four and we can figure out Joey and Bob's preference to swimming. We can say, well, we don't actually have to learn that Joey likes to swim and that Bob doesn't like to swim. If we just learn that, you know, Joey is a fish and all fish likes to swim, then we can say, well, because Joey is a fish, he likes to swim. And we can say the same. We don't have to learn that Bob doesn't like to swim because we know Bob is a cat and cats don't like to swim. We can therefore say that because Bobby is a cat, he doesn't like to swim. But these two statements, you can see that we don't have to learn them off by heart because we could have deduced them from other information. So like I say, that's a very elementary example. Let's maybe look more at a database to kind of make it, see if this will maybe make more sense. So a bad database design is when you record someone's ID, you record their date of birth, and you record their age amongst a whole bunch of other things. A good design is where you just need to record their ID because especially here in South Africa, you can determine the date of birth from the ID number. It's the first uh, six numbers and you can determine the age from the date of birth. So, for instance, if we had 1000 policyholders, a bad design would have to store 3000 pieces of information, 1000 IDs, 1000 date of births, 1000 ages. But a good design would only need to store a thousand pieces of information and two knowledge connections that will then allow me to call that other information if and when it is needed. And we can see that this can get quite interesting when it comes to, say, our actuarial policies. Because a bad database design is when you're storing both the benefit and the premium and the waiting period. And I mean, you, you know insurance products, there's a lot of parameters to them. A better database design would be to look at not only just to say the relationship between benefit and premium, but you know all the relationships between the product type and all the other parameters. And this can really help you to reduce the amount of things that you need to store. But let's talk about benefit and premium because there's normally quite a strong relationship between the two. So you don't have to uh, store both, you just need to store one and the calculation to get the other one. And that can drastically reduce the amount of data you need to store in your database. And you can think of your brain as a database, okay? The less you need to remember, the less likely you are to forget. So a very, very valuable skill while you're reading is to try and be able to distinguish, is this information, is this a first principle, or is this deduced knowledge? And if it's information, that's what you want to learn. If it's knowledge, rather look at how it was formed and learn the connection rather than the knowledge itself. And that's going to drastically reduce the amount of information that you need to read and learn for these upcoming exams. So like I said, don't fall into the trap of condensing knowledge into information and then trying to learn that off by heart. Then, of course, the final part of our pyramid is, uh, is wisdom. And I mean, what is wisdom? And I guess there's different types of wisdom. You know, you get wild wisdom from divine revelations and you get, you know, worldly wisdom from, from ancient teachings and all these kind of things. But let's just maybe for simplicity say that wisdom is the optimal application of knowledge. Now, we might ask ourselves, how do we transform knowledge into wisdom? This one's a little bit trickier. Uh, we need this thing known as consciousness, you know, whatever that kind of means, uh, enlightenment, and I guess maybe bringing it back to the profession, we refer to it as actuarial judgment. But again, this is, this is a difficult thing, and it's one of the reasons why artificial intelligence hasn't become, yeah, you know, hasn't taken over the world yet is because from a programming point of view, how do you program judgment? How do you program consciousness? It's still something that we don't really, really understand. Um, 
But what we're going to see is that in the fellowship levels and even in the specialist subjects, we are called or we are tested on our actuarial judgment, which means as a student, if you don't develop your consciousness, if you don't become enlightened, you're going to struggle in these specialist exams. And I think that's why a lot of students, they can do all the mathematical stuff. They don't have this enlightenment or consciousness to have the inquiry mindset. And then they struggle and they keep repeating these specialist subjects again and again and again and again. So if that is you, you might want to look at trying to develop this actuarial judgment. And I mean, one of the ways you can do it is by, you know, reading up on philosophy, entering into ethics debates, and just yeah, exploring that whole part of, of your mind. Because when we look at the exam type questions, we've got the theory questions. These are, you know, sometimes they're quite easy. We just recall information. So it's like, how old is MJ now? We take the date of birth, we take the current date, we subtract the two, and boom, we know how old MJ is. We're recalling the information of when he was born in order to determine when it, how old he is now. Theory questions can get a little bit hard when they want us to recall knowledge and the, you know the knowledge connections as well. For example, you know is MJ legally allowed to drink in South Africa? Now you have to know the the drinking age in South Africa and MJ's age, and then put those two together to determine whether he can or can't drink. Uh, but in general, theory questions, if you've learnt, if you've put in the time and effort to memorize the information, you should be getting a hundred percent on this. You then have the application questions, which make up the bulk of the specialist subjects. And you've got some easy ones where you simply have to apply the formula. You know, how old will MJ be in 2030? Now it's like, okay, you know, 2030 minus 1991. It's like a little bit like the theory, but it's, it's you know, maybe it's just in a bit of a different setting. Of course, you can also get some hard curveball questions, you know, was MJ allowed to drink alcohol in Belgium in 2008? Now you maybe need information on what is the drinking age in Belgium, how old was MJ in the year 2008, you know, it can get a little bit more convoluted, but essentially these are some of the application questions. And then when you get to the fellowship level, this is where your higher order questions start to appear. This is where they become a lot harder, okay? In fact, there aren't any easy higher order questions. They're all hard. They all require this wisdom or this actuarial judgment. And I guess a fun, a fun example would be, you know, how much alcohol should MJ drink at the next, you know, Actuarial Society of South Africa's convention? And like I say, with all of these answers, it depends. It depends. If he's nervous, it might be worthwhile having a, a drink or two to you know, be able to socialize. Uh, if he's presenting uh, a very intense paper, maybe he should stay away from the whiskey. But like I said, these are some of the exam type questions that we could could come across. If we were to return back to, to knowledge, um, like I said, we were talking about how we can connect information, we can then transform it into knowledge. We can maybe ask ourselves a little bit of a deeper question now. You know, how do we connect information? And we can do so using things known as semantic relationships. And semantic is just a fancy word, I guess, for, for meaning. And we see that this is used by artificial intelligence, natural uh, language processes, unstructured databases, and translators. And how I actually came across it is I was working for a company that was creating unstructured databases in the insurance world. And they were using these semantic relationships. And when I was Googling them, I saw that they had links to, to artificial intelligence. So I got really interested in AI, started, you know, really just getting very excited about these things. And I kind of thought to myself, well, if I can learn how machines learn and reverse engineer that, maybe we can make a study method based on how machines are programmed to learn. Because maybe they would be very, very efficient. So if we look at how engineers are training machines, maybe we can use that process to help us as individuals learn. And so what we're going to see is that these semantic uh, relationships that are denoted by a fancy Greek word and a, and a question. And we can use them to create intelligent mind maps as a study tool. And what I mean by an intelligent mind map, essentially it's a mind map where you label the lines that connect the various concepts. So let's maybe go through a few of these semantic relationships. So the first one is the, the hypernym and the, the Greek word hyper means, means above. Think if someone's hyperactive, uh, they're more active than usual. But in this context, hyper above 
means we're looking at a more broader term and the question word that's linked to it is what is it so if you say um, I've got a cat and someone says what is a cat you can say a cat is an animal an animal or the, t the concept of animal is above the concept of of cat because cat inherits a lot from animals and all that kind of stuff um, well if we look at the other side of the relationship we've got hypno uh, hypnonym Hypno is the Greek word for, for below. Think when you get hypnotized, you get put under. Uh, and this is a more specific term. You know, so what are some examples of it? So if I said my term is, is a dog and I want to know what are the hypnonyms of dog, uh, then corgi, pomeranian, all those cute fluffy things, those would be the uh, hypnonyms of the concept of, of dog. We then have holonym. Um, hollow is the Greek word for for whole and it's kind of like you know what system does it belong to think of the word holistic you know especially in enterprise risk management we talk about a holistic approach to to risk management it means you want to look at the, the whole so hollow is whole and the question here is you know what system does it belong to then we have meronym where marrow is the Greek word for part, and here we ask ourselves this question, you know, what is it made out of? Now, these are the four main types of semantic relationships, or the ones that I found out on the internet. Um, I went and I added a few more because I wanted to introduce, um, which was the ones here that I introduced. I wanted to look at what can a concept do? Uh, this is this red one, which I referred to as the, the active nim. Then I wanted to also look at what could be done two concepts and this is what I refer to as the passive nim then I also wanted to look at the parameters you know what are the various things that make it make it unique uh, which I don't know if I should call it the paranym or the diamond still still kind of contemplating that and then the associonym which is you know what other concepts is it in memes with and by memes I mean association not those funny little pictures that you see on on reddit uh, so very quick example of how to use semantic uh, relationships like if I had to say to you, discuss the concept of a house for 10 marks, um, a lot of students would struggle. They'd be like, well, a house is something I live in. And then they'd be like, you know, what else do I say about it? But if you take a concept and you look at each of the semantic relationships, you can see that you can start pulling out a lot of information. So if we had to start with, say, the hyponym, what is a house? A house is a building. Hypnonym, what are some types of houses? Well, a house can be a cottage, a hut, a mansion, etc. Holonym, you know, where can one find a house? What system is it part of? And a house can be part of a neighborhood, a village, a town, a city, etc. The meronym, you know, what is a house made out of? Well, a house is a building, and buildings are made out of roofs, floors, windows, doors. So maybe, you know, this house inherits from its hyponym, and it too also has roof, floors, windows, doors, etc. Then, of course, we've got the, the asonym. Uh, you know, what is a house associated with? It's associated with wealth, family, comfort, dogs, maybe mortgages as, as, as well, loans and those things. Uh, the diamond, you know, what are the main parameters of a house? Its size, its value, its location, its architectural style. You can see, we, we want to talk about a house for 10 marks. There's a lot we can actually chat about when we start splitting it into these semantic relationships. The passive nim, what can be done to a house? Well, it can be designed, it can be built, it can be destroyed, it can be painted, it can be sold, it can be mortgaged, it can be flipped. You know, there's all these various things. And then active nim, what can a house do? It can shelter, it can protect, it can impress, it can enrich, etc., etc. And then we can put this all together on a nice, I guess, like I say, a little mind map. And then you can either connect it using different colors or on the links you can have the you know the question words connecting it and you can see there's a lot here that we can talk about if the exam was to ask us what is what is a house and where this becomes quite powerful is like let's say the question was you know what is a credit default obligation and you might be like oh gosh what on earth is that um you're like uh, but if you say hold on a credit default obligation is a financial instrument Okay, what are financial instruments? Well, they belong to you know the financial system. They may be on a clearinghouse, or there's investment bankers involved. Uh, what can they do? You know, what do financial instruments do? They can enrich people. They can protect. They can manage risk. They can do this. They can do all these kind of things. And you can see, even if you don't know what the thing is specifically, you can still garnish a little bit of marks 
by looking at the, the hyponym and then seeing what are some of the, the standard or obvious things that it inherits. So you won't get 100% because you don't know exactly what the CDO is, but you'll still be able to put in a bit of an answer so that you'd make sure that you pass the exam. So semantic relationships are also quite powerful when it comes to entering into the exam, when it comes to structuring your answers, and also as a great way to tackle a an exam question where you don't know the answer um, or you get maybe tripped up with a, a very strange concept that they throw at you. So yeah, semantic relationships, they help us to understand more while studying less because I guess, yeah, we can use this inheritance property with the hyponym to learn less because we can see, okay, from the hyponym, this is the information and it's not the knowledge that we have to condense back and, you know, fill our brains with those kind of things. Then we can also understand a lot more with, with holonyms, knowing its place in a system. This can also help us answer the question, well, why does it exist? Well, oh, maybe the system wouldn't function properly if this thing didn't exist. That's like a very structured or simple answer to a very broad, broad question. But they can also help us generate new ideas. I mean, there's this thing called the scamper, where you substitute, combine, add, modify, put to other use, eliminate, or reserve. That's the little acronym. And here we can look at the meronyms. We can ask ourselves, well, how crucial is each component? You know, it's kind of like, well, if we were to add an expiration date to whole life assurance, oh, look, we get term assurance. What would that do? It would drastically reduce the cost of the premiums, actually might make insurance a lot more affordable, and we can maybe, uh, you know, tap into a whole new sect of the, of the market. And then we can be like, well, what if we were to substitute financial benefits for replacement products? And we see that this is very effective in funeral insurance here in South Africa that is plagued by fraud that causes the premiums to be inflated. And so by actually substituting a payment for a, for a product, then we know that fraudsters are not going to target this product that much. So we can see that by understanding the semantic relationships, not only can they help us to study and pass exams, but they can also help us in the workplace in order to create new products and tap into new markets and you know provide financial to to more people at a more affordable cost so but I mean don't worry about that for now we just want to help us to structure our exam uh, answers saying you know what is the question actually asking for uh, this is a big one this is a big one because I asked uh, the students you know what is finance I think we can actually get that onto that in the next slide and we saw that they answered a different thing so when you read the question maybe ask yourself okay does this question want me to give a hyponym or a holonym? And sometimes, you know, questions that are worth a lot of marks, you can use these semantic relationships to give your answer structure. So if they say, I mean, I actually think I've got a chair on the next slide, so let's jump to it. You know, what is what is finance? I asked my students in this F105 course, what is finance? Uh, for just one mark, I was looking for the hyponym. And if we look at the, the word hyponym, uh, we could have said finance is a value system and the hyponym link phrase is a so whenever you see you know a cat is a animal a cottage is a house that is a phrase shows that we have a hyponym link and this is so whenever you get asked the question what is something you should say something is a okay that's that's what I was looking for some of the answers I was getting some people saying finance is associated with and they went on and on and on and I was like okay that's the associonym or I had someone actually had a couple of answers say I said what is finance and they started saying well there is corporate finance personal finance public finance and they then went into all explaining what those things were I was like okay great but you gave me the hypnonyms or someone was like finance is part of the economy and all these kind of things and I was like okay you know, this is, actually, that's not the meronym, that would be the, the holonym, uh, because the, the system that is part of. But the whole thing here was that it was a very, very simple question, and not many of the students replied with saying finance is a, you know, and you could have even just said finance is a subject, or finance is, you know, something people think they understand. As long as it was just, I was looking for that phrase, is a. Um, but I know with finance and even with, with the other course, risk, you know, you say to someone, what is risk? Risk is a. Uh, it's hard to fill in that blank and it's, it does start you, start you thinking, you know, and, and that's what I do like about these questions. Now, if I was to say, what is finance for 10 marks? This is where you can maybe say finance is a value system and then you can say well there are various types of finance such as corporate personal public you know it's part of the economy it's this, you know that's when you can start branching out 
uh, but you first answer the question that is asked with that semantic uh, relationship. So like I say, in the F105 course, which is the financial specialist, and also with the F106 students that I did where I asked them what is risk, uh, they also struggle to answer it, which is interesting because the subject is specializing in risk or specializing in finance, and I'm asking, well, what exactly is it? And we, we seem to struggle with, with a question like that. Of course, there are problems with semantic relationships. Like I say, uh, if one was to look at artificial intelligence, they're amazing at theory and application questions. You know, if you had to say like, okay, Google, what is the drinking age in South Africa? It's gonna say that drinking age is 18 or, or something like that. But it's not very good at the higher order stuff. If I had to say, okay, Google, you know, how much should I drink tonight? It's gonna be like, um, I don't think I understood the question properly. And so what we see with semantic relationships is that they're very powerful for transforming information into knowledge. But what study tool can we use to help us transform knowledge into wisdom? And like I say, maybe we're seeing that AI is struggling because it doesn't have this consciousness. And I think a lot of students in actuarial science, you know, either they don't have the inquiry intelligence or maybe we're struggling because humanity itself is losing consciousness. Now, what do I mean by humanity losing consciousness? For that, we're going to have to turn to Max Weber. He is a philosopher on modern Western society. He looked at the impact of industrialization. And his big idea was that rationality has put us into iron cages, that science has sterilized our minds, that we have become disenchanted with life. And we see Eric Fromm, who studied with uh, Weber's brother, would echo these concerns where he talks about life becoming standardized and robotic. Even Nietzsche would go on to predict nihilism, you know, the secular idea that life has no meaning. And even now we find ourselves in this age of postmodernism where we're challenging the very concept of meaning. And why this is all very, very dangerous and why I think we're seeing people struggling with these exams is because we need meaning in order to learn. So that's why we're now going to be turning on to two other books from DK, uh, the sociology book and the mythology book. So like I say, this is where I do get a lot of resistance from students who are maybe writing the exam for, for the first time. They're like, uh, MJ, you, you're a little bit of a crackpot. But I think students who have failed the exam a couple of times and they're eager to look at an alternative method might be more open and, yeah, more open to maybe a, a little bit of a different idea. So let's maybe look at the study tip of embracing mythology. And the reason why I like mythology is because I asked myself this question, you know, why are mythic stories so easy to remember? If you think about Zeus or you think about Thor or some of the Egyptian gods, uh, you read one or two of the stories once and you kind of remember them for a very, very long time. And I think it's because mythology is packed with meaning. And so a good study tip is to create a narrative, is to build up a story. And if you do so, you will be amazed at how much easier it is to recall information and how much easier it is to now start judging and discerning. And again, this isn't just an isolated, you know, Michael's gone crazy idea. We see Robert Schiller won the Nobel Prize in economics in 2013 because he looked at psychology and how it relates to the market. And his whole big idea was that the narrative drives the price of stocks. And I've been looking at Bitcoin and it's definitely driving the price of Bitcoin. So the global narrative around Bitcoin very much determines what the price of it should be. From Bitcoin is dead to Bitcoin is coming back to Bitcoin is here to stay to all these kind of things. It's the narrative that ultimately drives the price of Bitcoin. And like I say, you can go read Robert Schiller. He's got a book called Animal Spirits, um, as well as a more recent one where he talks about, you know, the studies that he did, which won him, like I say, the Nobel Prize in, in economics. And it's, it's strange because a lot of economists, they're like, oh, we don't want to touch this fuzzy stuff. You know, we want to stick to stick to our maths, stick to our maths and our models but we kind of see that, mm, get out of the iron cage and, and yeah, just embrace these things. So what I kind of do, especially this works in, in enterprise risk management, uh, which subject F106, uh, I kind of look at mythology and in building up a whole course around it. And I refer to risk as being a dragon sitting on a pile of gold. And to me, I say that the dragon is danger, the gold is the opportunity, and risk has got this dual nature. 
And what we kind of see here is that if we run away from the dragons, we forfeit the gold. And that's just, a, I guess, a mythological way of saying that removing risk completely also reduces the upside. And I kind of see risk management is the armor we put on. If our armor is too heavy, we can't move. It's also very, very expensive. And we see this happen in businesses where there's too much risk management. It becomes very, very restrictive for the business to innovate and do things. However, if the armor is too light, there's not enough protection. And, you know, these businesses are also left at being vulnerable. They can get hacked and all these other crazy things. Now, the fun thing with mythology is that you can add visuals to make your study notes a little bit more fun. So whenever I think of risk, I've got my dragon, which is the, the danger, and I've got my gold, which is the, the opportunity. Then when we start branching off into risk concepts, such as introducing an excess or retention limit, you know, there's little images that you can have with it. I mean, the risk taxonomy. Uh, then there's this idea in risk management where you can have two risks that can cancel each other out, such as longevity and mortality risk. Think of it as a fire and ice dragon. And then we spoke about some of the risk management and the armor. And then you can really go crazy with your, your fantasy story. Think of corporate governance as, you know, the king talking to his advisors, the regulators or the gods in the sky. Uh, and then yeah, your insurer is essentially the witcher. Someone pays him money to go and fight their monsters. He takes on the risk. He takes on the danger that he might get eaten by this thing. But if he does kill it, the village is happy and yeah, you got to toss a coin to, to your witcher. So you can use this whole story and some students really embrace it and they're able to memorize the content very, very easy. Other students I know who may be still stuck in the iron cage, still holding hard onto to, to science, uh, might see this as being, being very, very silly. But what we essentially have is with our micro mythology, this is kind of like for each subject or for each topic. And then we can also have a macro mythology, which we can almost use for life and for the whole actuarial pr profession. And I guess uh, Carl Jung, uh, he's got some quotes on this where Carl Jung, he's basically him and Freud invented psychology or, or did a lot of groundwork on it. Uh, he was a medical doctor, worked at you know these mental asylums for I think it was like eight years and was able to cure people, was able to cure uh, people who had gone mentally insane just through talking by explaining what their dreams meant and all this kind of stuff. But he said that myth is more individual and expresses life more precisely than does science. And he says the most important question anyone can ask is, what myth am I living? So let's look at Carl Jung's macro mythology and how we can then apply it to, to how our exams. Um, so yeah, Jung had this whole idea that uh, the goal of humanity I mean, Nietzsche, <laughs> Nietzsche said not only does humanity lack a goal, but it also lacks basic humanity. But we'll put that to the side. Let's look at, at Jung. Jung's whole idea that the goal of humanity is to restore paradise. I mean, it's also if you look at a lot of the major religions, um, especially the whole Christian story, you get kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Jesus comes and saves everyone and we will eventually all go back to, to heaven. We'll get restored into to paradise. But it's this whole idea of restoring paradise. I mean, Donald Trump even used it in his whole campaign. He didn't say, let's make America great. He said, let's make America great again, you know, great again, restoring paradise. So this is, I guess, very, very high level that the goal of humanity is to restore paradise. Of course, paradise looks very differently to very different people. Uh, so this may be say, well, what do we mean when paradise is restored? So paradise is restored, this is according to Jung, when order and chaos are perfectly balanced. So what we can do is we can confront chaos and establish order, or we can cause chaos and we can disrupt order. And like I said, some people want more order, some people want more chaos, and this is what causes, I guess, the, the general conflict in, in our world. Because if people feel like there's too much chaos, then there's confusion, there's anarchy, they feel like they're drowning in life. If there's too much order, some people feel like they're suffocating, it gets tyrannical, and they can't move. And if we look at humanity and specifically history, even recently, we tend to swing between these extremes. Think about it. We have COVID. This is a, an agent of chaos coming in. Everybody's getting sick. So how do we confront this, this you know, huge chaos? Well, we smack it with a lot of order. We cause this lockdown. Literally, no one is allowed to move, closing down borders. It was a lot of order. 
But what happens? People don't like, you know, suffocating. There was a lot of problems, psychological issues of people getting locked down. That causes a lot of boiling, a lot of, you know, people like getting pent up. And so what we had were protests all around the world. There were protests here in South Africa, America, everywhere kind of had protests, which was a reaction to this extreme form of order. And of course, it's an element of chaos, and sometimes there can be some damage and danger from it. So what happens, we need more order in the form of police, which is restrictions, fear, arrest, and we kind of tend to oscillate between chaos and order and all of these type of things. But forget just reality, if we were to turn to the entertainment and the movies that we watch, we can see that this is kind of like our modern mythology. I mean. The whole story, you know, the Luke Skywalker saga, Star Wars, Harry Potter, they were all written uh, based on Joseph Campbell's work, you know, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And he was very much a student of Jung who looked at all the structures of these mythological stories, packed it up quite nicely. I know Dan Hartman follows it um, almost to a T when he starts writing the the Rick and Morty stories. So we can almost think of this as our, our modern mythology. And we see here that we've got different types of villains. We've got your tyrannical villains. These are your agents of order. Let's say Darth Vader. And then Luke Skywalker is actually an agent of chaos. He actually runs in there and he causes chaos by destroying the Death Star. But then you also have villains who are anarchists. These are the, the agents of chaos. Um, like in the movie, The Joker, you know, Batman then needs to, to bring order to to Gotham because we've got the Joker blowing up hospitals and doing crazy things and then Batman is then kind of like an, an agent of order and I guess we can kind of consider as you know when we like I said what is finance we could almost say that finance is a system of order you know it's it's a system of value it rewards people for being productive but essentially it, it orders people into how they should work where they should work and for how long they should work and what we see actuaries do is we're agents of order and our whole job description is to confront chaos in the financial system. So for us, risk is chaos, risk management is, is order. That's why, I mean, think, what does an actuary do? We create all these insurance and financial products to restore a person's financial situation after a catastrophe has befallen them. So if someone in the family dies, we give them a benefit to compensate for all the income that that loved one would have generated in order to take care of their dependents. So actuaries, we're part of this global mythology. We're the agents of, of order. And the reason why I bring that up is because this is also another reason why I kind of feel some people are struggling with actuarial science because maybe it's not the myth that they want to be living. Because remember, if you're an artist or an entrepreneur and you're disrupting and you're creating, you know, then you're an agent of chaos. So chaos and order are not necessarily good or bad. You know, they're a little bit of a little bit of both. And I think why we sometimes see very intelligent people struggling with actuarial science is because unconsciously they don't want to be agents of order, they'd rather be agents of chaos. Because there is a lot more fun, I'm not gonna lie. It is, it is a lot more fun uh, creating your own business, throwing paint around, than going through risk models. So you need to ask yourself this question, You know, do you really want to be an actuary? And sometimes that's a hard question for students who've come you know, who've done all the, the associate subjects or the mathematical subjects and are now struggling with the specialist and the fellowship ones, you know, to come to this realization now, it's like, oh, I'm halfway, you know, did I maybe make the, the right decision with regards to, to my career? And like I said, this is what I had for my F106 students. It was crazy because after I did this whole thing, um, so in, in F106, we've got the, the James Lum book on enterprise risk management, and it was written by a guy who's based in Hong Kong. And he talks a lot about the yin and the yang of risk management, about how you've got to balance these two, two forces, basically of order and chaos. And in every munch of order, you need a drop of chaos, and in every chaos, you need a drop of order. And the best place to be is right in the middle. And I mean, those of you who are interested in property know that the most valuable property, especially here in Cape Town, is Clifton because you've got the ocean, which is you know nature's chaos, and then you've got the mountain, which is nature's order, and you're literally in between the two, you're balancing these two things, and that's why the property in Clifton, uh, you know, with the mountain and the beach, is the most valuable property in, in town. So we, we even see it manifesting 
in, in property markets. But I brought this up because when I was going through the mock exam, I first wrote the exam, everyone did the things, and then I realized, gosh, every single question that we did was either dealing with some sort of chaos or order, and the aim of each of these questions essentially was to restore paradise. So a lot of times students say to me, I just didn't know what the exam question was asking. You know, what was I, what was I doing? So you can either look at, you know, what is the hyponym, what is the hypnonym, which semantic relationship is it asking, or you can take maybe come to this more mythological side and say, hold on, is there too much order? Is there too much chaos? And does my answer ultimately restore paradise? Because a lot of times you read a student's answer and you're like, well, what was the point? You, you wrote a lot of things that look like you copied and pasted from the notes, but what's your point? What's your conclusion? So always make sure that your conclusion, especially in these fellowship and specialist subjects, that they're restoring some sort of, of paradise. And it can be very valuable if you can identify if there's too much chaos, if there's too much order, and you know which one do you have to maybe confront or establish and all those kind of things. So I guess in conclusion, the big thing here is that the exam has already started, okay? What you do now will influence your chances of passing. And so the best way to study is to make it meaningful. Don't be passive, be an active learner. And that means using semantic relationships, this is the science and the logic behind meaning, or creating mythology, and these are, like I say, stories enriched with lots and lots of meaning. And the best way to answer your exam questions is therefore to make it meaningful. So use the semantic relationships to plan and structure your answer, and then use mythology. Say, am I confronting a chaos? Am I disrupting an order? Does my answer restore paradise? And like I said, when I gave this for the Actuarial Women's Committee, there was space for us to ask questions and do all that kind of stuff. And I guess you can do that in the comment section below. So let me know your thoughts, any questions, and yeah, we can chat a little bit more about it. I know this has been a long video, so let me not uh, waste any more time. And let me say all the best for the exam, and I'll speak to you all soon. Cheers.